So let's start off straight away by the sla saddest slide of all. In fact, I don't have any disclosures. When I, thought, when I my students and postdocs, I always tell them this is the saddest slide ever because we should have really got some IP as we were talking about earlier about some of this stuff. So for the work I'm talking about today, no financial disclosures. What are we doing and why are we doing it? Um, I show this slide every talk I give, even if it has nothing to do with the rate of pharmaceuticals, it still shows the slide, so I think it's a great slide. Um, left hand, some people who know the punchline for this, but left hand side is a, a gentleman with castrate resistant prostate cancer. This is his bone scan, a technetium bone scan, showing the, the localization of disease in his bones. In the middle, castrate resistant prostate cancer, gentleman with FDG, showing um, bony metastasis in the spine. Right hand side, fluorodihydrotestosterone, that's testosterone labeled with F18. And as you can see, the patient has a lot, well, can you, I'm not sure the lights might be a bit too bright, but you can see that there really is um, a lot more disease. Left image, middle image, our standard care, right image is a boutique tracer that we make. Um, of note is this is actually the same patient within 48 hours. So the two standard care images on the left and the middle just don't pick out even 10% of the disease the patient actually has. So I think this really shows you how the boutique traces that we're doing aren't necessarily for diagnosis, but it really is going to tell you something about the biology or the status of a patient which the standard techniques do not show you. Can everybody see that? The image is okay? Right there? Yeah, okay. So, um, one thing that we can do with this though is we, we aren't in the business of making something that's di going to diagnose cancer. Most of the patients that come to us already have advanced disease. We know they have cancer. What is important is, what is the biology of that cancer? We know metastasis in the right tibia, um, when compared with the metastasis in the left tibia, in the same patient, could have vastly different biology. This is why patients don't respond to therapies, because there's no such thing as homogeneous cancer. It's all completely different, even within the same patient. But what we can do is start using these markers for telling us something about the biology of the tumor, or, in this case, is the patient going to respond? Left-hand side, again, is a patient with a uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. They've been given medivation therapy. This is the new androgen therapy that's just gone through fast-track approval at the FDA. And this is their baseline image before therapy. And then four weeks later, we image them again with the testosterone to look at the extent of the androgen receptor. And we have shown beautifully that what medivation therapy has done is blocked all the androgen receptors available on the tumors. So we've shown that the drug has hit its target, which is phenomenal. But have we shown that that means those tumours are going to respond? And that's the next stage we're getting at. So, for example, patients on tamoxifen with breast cancer, we can look at FES and show that the drug has hit its target. FDHT, we can do that. But is this going to tell us how that patient is going to respond tumour to tumour? Um, molecular imaging probes is something which I used to be very much a radio pharmaceutical chemist and I still consider myself one. But I also do need to say that um, we, we aren't a standalone discipline anymore. We are reliant on optical MR. Um, all imaging modalities are becoming hybrid. There used to be things as, as a PET and a CT, now it's a PET CT. Um, and this is kind of the way we're going. We have to think very carefully about the modalities we're going to use, but the platforms we're going to use to look at them. And the paper by Jan Grimm and Ralph Weisleider really kind of started breaking these down into four classifications of imaging probe, non-specific probes, targeted probes, activatable probes and cell tracking. Regardless of the platform, it ultimately gets down to signal to noise ratio, how much goes to your target to how much the background. So even if you have a very tiny amount that goes to your target, if you have zero background, you have a great amount of resolution to get an image. But if you have a huge amount of your drug going to your target, but your background is also incredibly high, your ratio may be useless. So we, you have to really think about how you're going to sign a platform. And I would actually say that for the most part, getting to a decent single choice ratio is perhaps the most important thing. Radio pharmaceuticals, small molecules, peptides, monoclonal antibodies, nano platforms. I'm going to talk more today about the monoclonal antibody and the peptide, uh, sorry, and the, the um, large, larger molecule size platform. Um, FGHT, the one I showed you, is a small molecule, and we spent a lot of time working on that. But I know there's an interest here in zirconium, so I felt it would be more appropriate to concentrate on the work we've been doing that, doing on that. We do have the ability to make um, a whole bunch of different nuclides. It is working. Um, I think most people are aware of the positron emitters, the shorter-lived ones, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, fluorine. 
the metallic ones or solid target ones. The one I'm going to talk more about is the Konium 89. It has a 78 hour half life and it is made on cyclotrons. I'm going to go into a bit more detail on this in a minute. But I think this is perhaps the most important column. To put zirconium-89 onto a small molecule that will have a biopharmacinetics of minutes or an hour, zirconium-89 is total overkill. You're giving the patient a totally unnecessary dose just to get an image one hour post-injection. That's when you need to go to these shorter-lived nuclides where perhaps are better with small molecules. But zirconium-89's half-life is extremely well matched with the biological half-life for antibodies, which normally takes days for their distribution. At Memorial, we have been very fortunate. These are all our traces that we currently have under clinical trial in patients. Um, as you can see at the top, we, we are quite F18 heavy. We have F18 glutamine, FIU, um, something for hypoxia. Then we go to um, iodinated small molecules. And then down here, we're getting to the antibodies where we use I124. We've just started doing zirconium patients, and now we have a nanoparticle in there. So we have a broad range of small molecules um, all the way up to nanoparticles in regards to the platforms we're using in our clinical trials. But it's not because we, we, we need all these because of all the different things we're looking at, whether it be proliferation or metabolism or an expression of PSMA. Um, and we have all the different indications um, that goes for. We, we do do a lot of pediatric work, especially with the antibodies, that's so important to note. So zirconium-89 is going to be the main um, stay nuclide I talk about today. As I mentioned, 78 hour half-life. The target is 100% abundant and commercially available, so that makes this cheap. We don't have to recycle, we can just buy it and use it, unlike a lot of the other solid target systems. We can make it on um, our cyclotron with very good yields, two to three hour bombardment, it's 45 to 65 millicuries. You're all going to have to know your 37 times table to turn that into megabex, which I know you do here. Um, one of these days, I'll actually not be lazy. And I, when I go to somewhere like Australia or Europe, I will actually put the megabex values on these slides, but um, I forgot to this time. And we can make it in high specific activity. Um, a postdoc that I, that, um, Jason Holland, who worked my first postdoc when I moved to Memorial, he was with me two and a half years, he's now just started at Harvard, did so much of the, the, the yeoman share of this work, and he's going to be spending, I think, three months here next year, so you'll all get to meet Jason Holland, um, the other Jason, or the third Jason now, since it's seen quite a popular name here. Um, the decay scheme is uh, zirconium-89, it's as a positron emitter, 22%. It does start off with the four minute metastable um, zirconium and then it decays down, back down to the, the itronomite, kind of a clean decay scheme. So the image quality is good. This is perhaps also shown that when you look at the um, energy spectrum of zirconium 89, here's the 510, which is for the positron, but it does have a 99 kV, but when you look at I124, itronomite 86, um, there's obviously a lot more complicated decay schemes we're dealing with here, where of course F18 is very nice because all you get is that 511. We are able to isolate the zirconium in high radiochemical purity, high radiochemical yield, and um, make it pretty much on demand. We'll make it once a week, and then we'll use it through the week. So now we have our, our nuclide. What, what do we do with it? How do we get it onto this biological entity, this protein, or this antibody? Well, we actually went back into literature. Turns out um, that use of desferoxamine is very good for using for zirconium-89. Desferoxamine is used as a chelation agent, patient as a, patients as a standalone agent for demethylation. It is something that we can easily attach to an antibody. Uh, at this point, not in a site-specific manner. We've just changed that. We are doing site-specific conjugations now, but at this point, we're just putting two to three onto an antibody and then we can add in the zirconium-89. The advantage is this is a facile chemistry, it's at room temperature. Um, antibodies are very sensitive, so we can't do a reaction that's going to include heat or, 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 or too harsh a condition because we'll perturb the immune reactivity of the antibody. So this works extremely well and we get very good yields and we can do a simple site exclusion or a spin chromatography purification to get the labeled zirconium away, um, antibody away from the free zirconium. Um, so I'm going to start off, this is um, a work which, which um, uh, Ivan mentioned, and this was a story which, for many people um, of my generation and older, I probably know a lot about um, transferrin imaging. It's been done with gallium for years, gallium citrate, inject it, goes to gallium transferrin, used for infection, used for all kinds of different cancers. And when, when this 
project was first presented, I was thinking, ah, I'm not so sure about this because it's transferring, you know, it's, we've done it. But, as I was saying yesterday in a meeting, um, what has happened is the fact that the biology, which used to be somewhat naive about what was going on in cancers, has now, now grown exponentially, kind of like my, my stomach, but grown exponentially to the point that we're now understanding so much about biology that some of these old tools that we had which we didn't really know how they're working. We can now look at these pathways which have been isolated and identified and perhaps bring some of these older tools back into what has gone in in the biological field. So transferrin has been used beforehand. It's been used as scallium citrate for um, spect imaging with, for cancer and inflammation. It's also done with thenium-103 for wound healing and technetium compounds. Um, what we wanted to do, oh, but, what came out recently, has been known in biology recently since this came out, is that the transferrin receptor, which is the CD71 receptor, um, expression levels are enriched in many forms of human immune models of cancer. This is something that they knew about it, but it wasn't until um, kind of this paper that came out that number three um, pathway associated with, with cancers um, is actually the transferrin receptor. So it actually became an incredibly relevant cancer target. CMIC expression levels are evaluated in 30% of human cancers, and I'm going to tell you that in a minute the relationship between CMIC expression and transferrin receptor expression. Um, I'm actually going to skip this slide and go to this slide because the gain in copy of, of MIC, and MIC again is absolutely one of those fundamental things now associated with cancers, about 30% of them, that MIC, downstream effect of this, um, is the transferrin receptor. So if you have MIC, you're going to have the transferrin receptor. If you have an overexpression of MIC, as you do in cancers, you're going to have a lot more of the transferrin receptor. And this is a fully validated target gene now for this. So MIC, transferrin receptor. So if we take transferrin and we radio label it, we can see how much transferrin receptor is present. If we have a gain in MIC and we have more transferrin receptor, we should have a much higher signal on the PET scan. It's kind of easy little paradigm to think about here. And this is what we wanted to see. In MIC models of cancer, does the transferrin signal increase um, based on the expression or the growth of cancer? Um, and in our case, prostate cancer, a third of all prostate cancers express CMIC, um, have a gain in CMIC copy number. So we took the transferrin, put on DFO, put on SCOM89. Kind of easy, straightforward. We did do, now as most people know, transferrin is there to transport iron around the body. So we did the APO and the HOLO versions with and without iron. We also did the human transferrin and the mouse transferrin is all shown to be the same. Um, but one of the things that transferrin is used for is looking at inflammation. So the first thing we did was look at an inflammatory model and we showed that the mouse transferrin and, the, and this is the MTF or the human transferrin did of course pick out inflammation in an inflammation model in mice. And this, in this case it was a turpentine injection into the flank um, the, of, the, of the leg of the mouse. So, all the data that we're going to look at when we go clinical, we are going to have to take into the issue of inflammation, but this is an issue we deal with FDG and everything else as well, but it is that little asterisk in the corner that says, and this could be an issue. So we wanted to first of all start off looking at um, CMIC um, transgenic mice. These are mice that have been developed over years, and these are the only MRs I'm going to show. Um, but what these... What these mice do is that they develop PIN. That is the um, prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia at two to four weeks. PIN, which many gentlemen have in their prostate cancers, is going to be the precursor to cancer. What we do know is that in these mice, 100% of these mice will develop prostate cancer in their prostates after 12 months. It's perfect and it's all, it's, there's never a mouse that doesn't get cancer. And this happens around the six month, part, uh, six month um, stage. So this is the bladder here, and this is the development of prostate cancer in the prostate of mouse. 12 months they all have it, and the switch from pin to prostate cancer happens around um, six months. And just in case you didn't know where the prostate was, here's a little diagram here under there. Um, so the first thing we did was to take all these mice that we knew would have this cancer, and we injected them and imaged them with zirconium transferrin. So these mice, we know, all have full adenocarcinoma in the dorsal prostate lobes. And when you look at this image, this is a PET image, it is a MIP image, so it's the size through all, these, all, the, all, all through the mouse. We were able to lineate prostate cancer in the prostate of these mice at 12 months. 
obviously an advanced stage. A mouse prostate isn't this big, but this is the carcinoma that has developed in these mice. But of course, as we all do with our animal studies, we skewed the data to be successful. We knew all these mice were going to have, have cancer. So, oh, this is just also shows a, a slice through the mouse over time as well, um, through the mice. But then we went back to four months old. Now, if you remember, at six months, we know they all transitioned from pin to adenocarcinoma. But for four months, it's that early stages. We don't know what it is. So we took four-month mice, and then we imaged them again. And we were extremely excited that this is not the bladder. This is, in fact, prostate cancer in the prostate of a mouse that it lit, lit up like a Christmas tree. We were able to delineate in the, in the mouse cancer in the prostate before the onset of, of, of full-blown um, prostate cancer. In the wild type mice, this is the bladder and the prostate is just below here, you're going to have to take my word for it. We don't see anything in the normal mice that don't develop cancer. This is just the bladder in this case. And we know this could be taken out of the tissues afterwards and confirmed. We're not just relying on, on images or CT, but we do know this is the case. So we were particularly excited about this, but one of the things we wanted to do is, does this image of transferrin in the mice of these prostate, which are developing the adenocarcinoma, does it mimic the known um, uh, histology of this system, but also the pathway that this cancer takes? So we would take out, sacrifice the mice, take out the prostate, and then we'd cut it up into the, the dorsal, ventral, lateral, anterior portions of the prostate and the bladder, and then we'd image that. And if we look at this first line up here, you can see that the, the, in the four-month-old mice, we saw transferrin up in the dorsal, in the lateral, but not so much in the anterior, not much in the cementical vesicles. And what this does, we confirm the histology, is that this transferrin uptake perfectly mimics the, the development of PIN into adenoprostate carcinoma. It starts off in the dorsal prostate, then it starts off in the lateral prostate, then the anterior prostate. So it perfectly mimics the biological um, behavior of how the cancer goes from PIN to full-blown cancer and we did confirm that with histology. Um, this is particularly exciting because we were able to see this was PET, but we could not delineate any changes by say, CT or with MRI. There's no other way to do this except by the imaging in situ in the mouse. So a lot of people now you rely on MR, for example, transrectal MR for looking at the extent of prostate cancer and, and its growth. Um, but this, that's change in tissues, you cannot actually see any changes in them are in these four month mice, but we were able to delineate them radiochemically with zirconium transferrin. So we've been particularly excited about this. Um, oh, that's, this is my little lesson. We've been particularly excited about this, and this is something we're now going to hopefully start next year in patients for um, monitoring disease. PSA is a horrible test, um, but when you have active surveillance on a, on a patient, this could be the way to see you, you, you actively active surveillance on a year-to-year -year basis, when you start seeing changes, that's when you get the, the, the aggressive treatment as opposed to doing, say, a radical prostatectomy, which is probably one of the most overused forms of, and unnecessary forms of treatment there are in, in gentlemen prostate cancer right now. Um, I always like putting this slide in because when we were, when this was at Nature Medicine, reviewer three, always reviewer three, so never one or two, it's always reviewer three. They're always the ones that have the issue, whether it be a grant or a paper. Um, reviewer three couldn't understand how we can image a transferrin receptor when we have so much transferrin floating around in our bodies naturally. So we actually, they said we want to do a blocking study. I'm like, you can't block it, you cannot block it. There's so much um, uh, transferrin floating around. So I said, well, if we're going to block it, we're going to do it big time. So we injected into a bunch of mouse 200 milligrams per kilogram of transferrin. And we actually did block the signal. So I'm particularly um, ex um, proud of this one because I never thought we could do it. And then I had my der moment. And I thought to myself, when we were, again, arguing with the reviewer number three, was, well, of course, it's, it's, we're at the radiochemical level. We're at the peak of molar concentrations. Of course, you can measure receptor, even though you have endogenous transferrin floating around. And then I thought to myself, well, if we can do that, how does FGG work? We have glucose floating around in our blood. So um, this was, it is actually possible to, just with FGG, block um, systems where you, have, where you have natural transferring floating around in the blood. Um, this isn't just going to work in prostate cancer. Transferring receptors are also present in particular glioblastoma. Um, most people don't die of their primary disease, except when it comes to brain tumors. Most people die of their metastatic burdens. Um, and so what we wanted to do was see if we could use this um, anywhere else, because in glioblastoma, you again have this PI3 kinase AKT CMIC pathway that's activating glioblastoma. And when injecting 
um, mice and we get a, a brain tumour into cradle injection and you do a zirconium image, you can really see, obviously this is ex vivo, you can really see ex extraordinarily well how well zirconium transferrin delineates the glioblastoma in these, in these tumours. The advantage is transferrin doesn't go into normal brain. So regardless of what's happening around here or in, in, in the liver or, or clearance properties, we have a really amazing contrast when we're doing zirconium transferrin in patients. Um, in, in, in brain tumours. And this is coming out uh, next month in the JNM. So this is where we really started the process. And we, I think we demonstrated this kind of transfer and it's an oldie but a goodie. We can go back and start doing some more work with this. And it's now because we're trying to get the chemistry with the biology. But what um, we really want to do is so we can use the transferrin for active surveillance. We can use the FGHT for showing we've blocked the antrin receptor. But I showed you this image earlier, that we have gone for medivation therapy baseline, we've blocked all the interoceptors, but it's not telling us if that patient is going to respond. It's telling us we've hit the target. And we know it's not going to tell us if it's going to respond, because when we look at patients which have had FGHT, FGG, or PSA levels measured, we get a mixed response. Even though we see this in so many of the patients, there is not a uniform response associated with that FDG image. Some of them respond, some of them don't. And what this, and when you look at this, it's more complicated, the slide, but when you look at FDG, they all got blocked. See how it all drops down here? But when you look at, say, for example, the PSA, 40% of these patients don't respond. About 30% have a mixed response by radiographic measurement. And FDG is just all over the place. So. We can actually surveil a patient. We know it's going to, they know they have a cancer. Then we could do FDHT to stage a patient and see if it's going to, the therapy's working. But now we need something that's going to tell us, is that therapy going to work on an individual basis on an individual tumor? So the first pace we went to was PSMA. PSMA is prostate-specific membrane antigen. It's actually an incorrect name. It's not prostate-specific anymore. Um, it's in the neovascular of all tumors, but it was first found in, in prostate tumors. And we have an antibody, J591. J591 was developed at Cornell. It, it, it targets an antigen on the external epitope of PSMA, as opposed to people may know about prostasynct, which targets the internal epitope of PMSA. That's why it's a useless drug. Um, but the PSMA is on the outside. And um, it started off, this is Mike Evans, uh, a very talented postdoc, um, where looking at the antrim receptor here, a, every time you see AR, it's actually antrim receptor here. The antrim receptor um, downstream um, expression is, is at the PSMA uh, antigen. And we have an antibody that, that targets this. So if you have a high antigen activity, you'll have low PSA expression because what it basically does is it's a block of the PSMA expression. It's, it's obviously not a downstream up regulation, it's a downstream down regulation of the PSMA. So if you have high antigen receptor activity, you should have low PSA activity. And therefore, with the zirconium J501, you get a low signal on PET scan. If, however, you have an anti-androgen that like MDV31, so it's blocking the antigen receptor, you get, over, you get more expression of the PSMA. So if you get more expression of the PSMA externally, the zirconium 89 should um, have an increase in the PET signal because you've got all present. So this stops this from, from being expressed, but if you stop this, <coughs> you get no expression of it. So taking J591, and they start off with copper 64 in this case, they took mice um, where they just gave vehicle, or castration of the mice, um, showed some signal. <coughs> but when you gave the antigen blocker, again, you're blocking the antigen here, so you're getting overexpression of PSMA. In these mice models with, with bilateral tumors on the flank, you saw an increase of uptake. So this really showed quite elegantly that by using MDB3100, PSMA was increased, the PSMA signal by J591 increased on PET. Um, the the COPPER-64 really didn't have an ideal half-life for the J591. COPPER-64 is a 13-hour half-life, so we wanted to match it with zirconium. And so Jason Holland then went on to J591, and he labeled it with um, DFO and zirconium, and he did some biodistribution studies. And by this, you get the, the activity, sacrifice the animal, count how much has gone to tissues. LINCAP is AR positive. PC3 tumors are AR negative, and then just as with the transferrin, an injection of cold antibody to show specificity. The link app here, um, very nice uptake indeed. Lower uptake in the PC3. This is because of the EPR effect, which I'll 
touch on a bit later, and then we can block it too. When looking at images, um, we first of all took the PC3, which are the PCS PSMA negative tumors, and we imaged these mice, and we saw tumors. And we realized, well, this isn't very good because it's supposed to be a PSMA negative tumor, but this is because of the EPR effect. All tumors grow fast, they get leaky, and you have what's called the enhanced permeability and retention factor. Did I get that right? I always forget this. Um, enhanced permeability and retention factor, where if you have big globulins like proteins and nanoparticles and stuff like that, because these are leaky, they just go into tumors and they stay there. And a lot of people use EPR effect for drug delivery. This isn't a selective uptake. This is just a leaky tumor that is taking up that. So whenever you do an antibody, you have to control for this EPR effect. When, however, you look at the, the PSMA positive tumors, you can really see after 24 hours how extremely nicely the zirconium DFO delineates the, the, the PSMA positive tumor. Um, again, the mouth. There is the, the liver here, and, and here's its head, but you can see there's such tiny background compared with the rest of the mouth. This was published in 2010. We are now doing this in, in patients. So 18 months later from that preclinical study, we're now on our clinical trial. I think we've done about 20 patients so far. The very first patient um, isn't the best image, but I think it's probably the way nice to show you the first one. It's a 56-year-old male, proven Gleason 9, adenocarcinoma of prostate, um, had, had other treatment and had failed. So he's castrate-resistant prostate cancer, had diseases in the bone and the nodes, and we gave 4.8 millicuries, again, 37 times table X, I don't know, I can't even do that math. Um, but that's how much we inject in the patient. When we, we go from left to right here, that when you look at three hours, um, there's an image yesterday, somebody said about Herceptin heart, but this really shows you at three hours the blood pool of the radiolabeled um, J59 just floating around in the bud and begin to delineate some tumors. One day you can start seeing clearance here of the radioactivity, but by day seven you'll begin to delineate out these tumors. Um, we do need to do better than this. When we look at the fluoride scan of the same patient and the FDG scan of the same patient, we, we obviously, it doesn't look like the image quality of this is better, but we started off on low activity, so now we can go up to higher levels and the images are far superior. And this is perhaps shown by this image. This is a gentleman that has um, his, his kidneys and here is a prostate cancer right here. Here's the patient's FDG. What we already know is that we are getting FDG hot, PSMA hot lesions, sometimes they're both cold, sometimes they're opposite each other in both ways. So we know that the biology from these, from these metastasis in the same patient are different. So what happens is our interventional radiologists, they look at this image, they look at the discordant metastasis in the same patient, and then they go off and they get biopsied. And that biopsy tissue then goes off to um, our clever biologists who start telling us what is different biologically between one metastasis in the patient and the one on his left-hand side compared to his right-hand side. So we're really beginning to, because if we go back to that very first image, I'm not going to go upset, you saw we had 74 lesions in that patient. There's no way you can biopsy that. You can only selectively biopsy a few of them. But if you can base an image on this one's different from this one, then you're only doing two biopsies, and these can be painful, but you're going to know that you're going to get discordant biologies that you can study further. Um, I always show this slide because Steve Solomon is our chief of internet radiology, and I do not know how to read, read this, but I can tell you that this is a major vessel, this is a major vessel, and that's that tumor. And he was particularly excited the fact that he managed to snake, snake in a biopsy needle somehow and actually get a biopsy from this. He goes, nobody else would have done that, but he did it because it was right near two vessels. So um, he's particularly proud of, of, of this. Um, this is a patient, as you can see, it is J591 hot, it is PSMA positive, but it's FDG cold. This is shown here. This is the PET CT. Hot, hot tumor, PSMA positive, FDG negative. So we already know that that's going to be different from another tumor. Um, this case, again, J591 hot, FDG cold. So again, biopsying this, and I think there was a lesion here in the kidney, in the bottom of the kidney here, that's FDG hot, but it's PSMA cold. So the, the biology they're learning from this is really going to start making a fundamental difference in how we can, we, we can image things. So we've shown this works. We've shown that, that we can knock out androgen receptor, PSMA goes up, and that's going to be the next part of the clinical trial. Um, we are, it is fully humanized and it is ongoing. But right now, the issue with J591 is there is no known clinical relevance between the PSMA and, and PSA. 
and the adrenal receptor. There's no associated, but there's no known clinical relationship between what the overall underexpression of those things mean compared to one of them on how a patient's going to respond. So we wanted to go um, to a system that we do know exactly how PSA or exactly is um, related to clinical outcome. Now I stood here earlier, you know, beginning of this talk and said how awful PSA is, where they kind of is, but it is a serum biomarker, it has inherent flaws, but what we want to try and do is use what is known biologically about PSA and try and circumvent the biological limitations of the serum biomarker by imaging it at its source. This was David Olmert, who's a, um, a fellow, he's, he's a uh, urologic surgeon, Mike Evans, again a postdoc, and this is something that from Charles and I's group um, that was started. And PSA is a validated biomarker, but we know, and this is absolutely rock solid in terms of the biology, is that high antigen receptor here, you get high PSA expression and a high signal, therefore, if you have an antibody, and we have one, 5A10, that images PSA, you should have a high signal PET scan. If you knock out the antigen receptor, you will not get as much PSA released, and therefore the low signal on the PET scan. But it's like, well, what are you doing? Imaging the PSA in the blood with 5A10? We're actually not, and this is, this is where we're overcoming the limitation of the serum biomarker. There is a point when you have free PSA. This free PSA is released into the extracellular luminal space. It is this that 5A10 binds. At some point after this, serpins come along and complex PSA. This is what really the, the, the serum um, biomarker is, it's the complex aspect. So we're able to hit this free PSA. There is some of it floating around the blood, but we concentrated the tumor, so concentrations on our side here, that we can image this with 5A10. And the hypothesis is that we can target this free form, and this, because of this relationship here with the androgen receptor, is going to much further um, give us a much, much more stronger relationship between PSA expression and how androgen activity is switched down. Um, also, serum biomarker. So you have PSA in the blood, but it doesn't tell you where a tumor is. It also doesn't tell you that if one tumor is overexpressing PSA from the other because all tumors are created differently. So to be able to image this is, is incredibly valuable for us. We started off, again, in our models of, of um, prostate cancer. Link at AR, we saw good uptake of zirconium 5A10, 20%. Um, the blocking study with cold 5A10, we blocked it. IgG, it's the, it's the EPR effect again, just immunoglobulin, just albumin, we saw 5%. So again, we know these are leaky tumors. PC3, low, zero or no levels of antigen receptor, so that's why we get less than 5%. And then the CWR22 is the castrate resistant line that has a moderate levels of PSA expression compared with the um, 5A10. Then when we looked at, um, can we use this as a biomarker response to the therapies? We took the um, mice, and this was just uh, a, a castrated mice, so again, the PSA is going up, vehicle. Um, but when we gave MDV3100, we closed off entirely the, the, the PSA signal coming from this tumor. So the androgen receptor is being blocked, and therefore we're not getting any release of PSA from the tumor. When the guys went to the lab and they did this on a dose response level, um, they took the vehicle, so we just worry about this graph here, then they gave three different doses of MD3100, the androgen blocker, 10, 40, 80. They saw at the tumor an extraordinarily good dose response. The more responsive the tumor was to the therapy, the less PSA was being released. So we were able to quantify the amount of androgen receptor inhibition by imaging the 5A10 release. So if you're going to put a patient on MDV3100, you give them a baseline scan. You then give them MDV3100. And because we're PET, we're able to quantify. If we can see a 50% drop in the amount of PSA being released by a tumor, does that mean it's going to respond or does it need to get other additional levels of therapy? This is exactly what we're trying to do now, is on a tumor-tumor -tumor basis, see if this, this will work. Um, the other important thing to note is that when we look at, um, again, gentlemen don't die of the prostate, primary prostate disease, they die, they die of metastasis and, and the bone is probably one of the biggest issues we have to deal with in terms of prostate cancer patients because of, um, because of the pain that's certainly associated with it. But if, um, and bone disease often results in fractures and, and things like this for the patient, where when you use fluoride for looking at bone scan, things like fractures also light up with F18. But 5A10, that does not happen. 
And so you can use the 5A10 as shown in this, that you're able to delineate quite nicely uh, um, bone disease based on this that won't also uh, um, light up when, when a fracture is caused by a, by a large metastasis. So with the 5A10, um, I forgot that. I've still got two more stories to tell, but not quite, quite as long. But we have actually effectively looked at clinical biomarker, and we've overcome this limitation, overcome the limitation of the serum biomarker by 5A10. We validate this castrate-resistant prostate cancer. The biggest issue right now is that's only a mouse antibody. So we're now going through the process of humanizing it, and that's, that's hopefully going to be done in the next six months, and then we'll start the clinical trial of that. But because we also... Um, realize that we kind of overcome the limitation of, of PSA. That's not the only biomarker people look at in the blood. They also look at CA99 and CA125. CA99 99 is the serum biomarker that's in oncology. Nerissa is one of my postdoc that's worked on this. And this is a biomarker that's often used for pancreatic cancers, ovarian cancers, and, and lung cancers. It's a blood test again. But it's flawed. Pan pa pancreatic cancer, you could release this, but nut regulation CA99 could be pancreatitis. Um, it's all these kind of things, but again, you don't know just by doing a blood test where that disease is or what it is, but it tells you maybe something there. So we wanted to see if our lesson from PSA could be translated to the 99 story. So the 199 um, is a serum it's also called the Silar Lewis A antigen. No relationship to me, I'm not that egotistical to name an antigen after me, it's been around way before I was born, I think. Uh, but this is the Lewis antigen, um, and it's a serum tumor biomarker. It's present in pancreas, lung, and colorectal lesions. We're able, just like with all our other entities, we can take the 5B1, label it with zirconium 89, and it remains renewreactive and we still have specific activity. And then we wanted to test it in our preclinical models. Um, after we'd shown histologically that in this case that the blue staining, I'm not a biologist but I get, I get these clever pathologists to tell me that brown means it's there um, that in this case this is a, um, a pancreas ductal carcinoma, we have a colon cancer, lung cancer ovary um, did I say it wrong? No, that was, oh that's bladder, ovary and then um, colon again but all this staining of brown shows the presence of this antigen in, in um, a number of different diseases. So we took a pancreatic tumour xenograft and injected with a 5V1, and you can really see how extremely well this antibody lights up the pancreatic tumour on the flank. Um, and a very good uptake. In this case, here's our EPR control. It's about 6-7%, but we were getting... Somebody said to me, how can you get a 100% injected dose per gram of a radiopharmaceutical? It's because it's weight, it's a small tumour, it's per gram. So everybody's like, how can you, it's, it's, it took me a while as a student to get that around my head. Um, but it really does show extremely well how this antibody works. But in most cases, as we all know, um, oh, and it also works well in small cell lung cancer and in colon cancer. But we're always putting um, tumours on the flank of mice. A pancreatic tumour doesn't grow on the flank of a patient. It grows in their pancreas. Um, so what we've also done is we've done orthotopic models where we've put the pancreatic tumour into the pancreas of mice. But we use cells that also had um, uh, the luciferase gene so that we could see the growth of these tumours over time by using optical imaging. So we, inje we injected these mice, in this case, the pancreatic cells have luciferase, wait to two to four weeks, measure volume, and because we're doing the pancreas, you use MR, but we can see the growth of the tumour here in all these mice. These are in the pancreas of these mice. We confirm something's present by MRI right here. Here's the tumour in the pancreas of, of the mice. And then we also do FGG and zirconium 89. So the use of bioluminescence and MRI was key here to make sure our model was established. When we then did a comparison of FGG, this is the FGG image here, here's the heart, here's the bladder, with the 5B1, you can see how, again, lousy in pancreatic cancer FGG is. It's a horrible thing for pancreatic cancer, as prostate. But we could really, in the very same mouse, the following day, really nicely delineate this pancreatic tumour that we just really could hardly pick out with the FGG. The advantage of 5B1 is, quite simply, is that it is a, it's not humanized, it is a human antibody. It's already human. So we don't have to go through that step. Um, and a lot of people said, well, you know, you're putting a human antibody in a mouse that doesn't express the Lewis antigen naturally. It doesn't. But we're now confirming this by making Lewis antigen mice to express normally the antigen and just make sure that we are on the right path here. 
Um, this is a really disgusting slide. I don't even know why I put this in this, but there, there's the signal from the pancreatic tumor, and, and here's the um, the signal in the pancreas right up here. But obviously, this doesn't exist anywhere else. And autoradiography. This is one of, one of my faculty, Sean Carlin, has become our resident expert in doing autoradiography, where he'll take out the tumor, image it on the autoradiograph to look at the location of activity, and then co-stain with the antigen and show that they overlap, that the 5B1 does target the tissue um, by h &E and by the expression of the antigen. This is perhaps the most important slide out of this entire story. We are trying to image a serum biomarker, but what we've also done in this system is in the pancreatic cancer is we've imaged those tumors before we can even detect the antigen in blood. So you also have a detection limit here, but we are, in those mice, when I go back up here, and you see this image, we were able to image at the source, at the tumor, before any detectable levels of the antigen in the blood. So not only have we overcome the limitation of the biomarker, but we've actually, in many respects, um, surpassed it because we've been able to see it before there are detectable levels in the blood because of that huge concentration issue. So I think this is, this is certainly something we're going to be doing in the next four to five months in, in patients. So the final um, quick story is uh, Mark 16. This is a, a, another postdoc, Sarah Chill, um, working with Davis Briggs, who's one of our um, heads of our medical oncology team for ovarian cancer. And Mark 16 is the CA125 serum biomarker. Again, this is another serum biomarker that's used and measured in, in women with ovarian cancer to see, to see um, a detect. Is there something there or to, see, to follow how things are going? Um, but what they have is an antibody, 99, that targets the MUC16. This, this is the CA125 getting shed off, but w they have an antibody that actually binds just below that point of separation. So if you're getting CA125 that you're detecting in the blood, you should be able to image at this point here in, in these patients with ovarian cancer. This is the first of images. We took MUC16 positive, MUC16 negative tum tumors, we lit up the MUC16 positive, but unfortunately the antibody just isn't clean enough yet, so we're going back. Uh, but I want to show this in there, show that it doesn't always work quite as beautifully at the beginning. You know, th this antibody, we know it's going to work, but we also have to go back to the lab and really do something better to get, our, get the protein cleaner and, and um, much better to use. But we already know, even sort of a dirtier system, that we can do this. So, despite their advantages, there are lots of bio <laughs> circulating biomarkers um, which are incredibly useful clinically, but they have documented limitations. What we try to do is to supplement some of these shortcomings by using antibodies to target them, PSA, um, which we're going to use for developing um, paradigms for imaging response, CA99, to try and distinguish between um, benign disease such as pancreatitis and, and, and full-blown um, ductal, um, ductal carcinoma, pancreatic ductal carcinoma. And what we're trying to do right now is build up this little Zeng diagram. At the moment, it's just two nice circles. I have a feeling we're going to get a third or a fourth. It's going to get too complicated. But we have with 5B1, we're, on, on one hand, we're rescuing the serum biomarkers with PET. And by that, I mean the 99 story I just told you, or 5B1 with PSA. We're also using these for si imaging oncogene signaling with immunopet. So if we're knocking out PSA, we're knocking out the androgen receptor or something like that. We can use the J591 for PSA or the transferrin if we're knocking, for example, out, out down MYC. The biggest issue with the, PSA, with the transferrin story right now and imaging MYC is there's only one drug, JQ1, that actually targets MYC. But there's such a huge field um, of, a, of a target for therapeutics that we're actually, for once, I think, ahead. We're ready with something imaging to see what happens. And then you also have the 5A10, um, which is the free PSA, and CG250, which is for non-small cell lung cancer, which kind of does both. Um, so with that, I need to just finally acknowledge my group. I, um, it's actually uh, Jason Holland who does the codium work here. Um, I know Narissa, who is doing the pancreatic work. That's her work right here. Um, I didn't talk about any of Brian's today. Oh, Mike is working on the on the ovarian story. Melissa is a graduate student who's so hopefully going to come spend some time here. She's just tucked back here. Sean, who does all the ultradiography. Um, and then I think what else work on pretty much other projects I didn't talk about today. Um, I do need to acknowledge Mike Evans. He's been involved in all these stories. He's the postdoc that, Mike, that Charles and I share. Um, he's now looking for a faculty job. He's, he's, he's amazing. He should really give himself a really good job. Um, and it's one of my imaging core for their help. 
Um, we've been very fortunate. We have had funding from the Department of Energy, the NIH, the STAR, the Therapeutic Foundation, National Science Foundation, and the, uh, the Jeffrey Bean Cancer Prostate Re uh, Research Center. I don't know here whoever owns a, uh, or has bought a Jeffrey Bean shirt, but Jeffrey Bean died, uh, sadly, I think about five years ago, of a brain tumor, and he had no dependents, so he left his entire fortune um, to cancer research. And we are fortunate to be one of the centers that hosts that philanthropic <laughs> center. But I think every um, Jeffrey Bean shirt that people still buy, money comes directly into the cancer research um, field. Um, there's very little profit that's taken, it's all plowed back into cancer research. Um, so we all acknowledge that because th it was this funding that got all of this going um, from the very beginning. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions.